Welcome to New Hope Bible College Online. Um, this is not something I'm really prepared to do at this point. However, we've got to do what we've got to do. Very difficult to make videos for the class. I'm trying to do it by myself here. So there's going to be a lot, little hiccups, I'm sure, throughout the process. Hopefully as time goes on, I'll be able to refine those out. And we'll have some quality videos for you. Uh, this first class, Genesis, second part of Genesis that we've been studying. Uh, we've, this, uh, right now, we'll start in Genesis chapter 22 with the great test that God gave to Abraham. Uh, God promised Abraham a son and promised that that son would be an, the heir of promise. Uh, but God decided he was going to test Abraham. And we see that a test in the scripture, a big difference between the test that God gives and what Satan is. Uh, whatever test that God gives us, we can pass. And that's the great thing about it. And the reason we can pass it is if we rely upon the Lord. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 tells us there's no temptation, no, no test that uh, is uh, but such as is common to man. But that God is faithful and will not allow us to be tempted or tested, but that which we are able, but with the temptation also make a way to escape, that we may be able to bear it. So God promises us here. And we see throughout the Bible over and over again uh, when God made a promise to us that God would keep the promise. God promised Abraham an heir. Abraham didn't know exactly what was going on, but Abraham fully trusted that God knew what he was talking about. So when God gives a test here, we see that he does it to confirm us. Uh, God giving Abraham a test to confirm the promise and to show that Abraham needed to trust God. And he also gives us tests to strengthen us. Now, on the opposite side, Satan, when he tests us, he does it to corrupt us, to, to harm us, to weaken us. Uh, we all go through tests in life, and we will continue to go through tests until uh, we pass away on this earth or the Lord comes back for us at the rapture. Uh, how we handle the test is up to us. We have the ability to pass those tests if we're where God wants us to be. We stray away from the Lord, then the temptations out there in this world are going to get the best of us. Satan will do his best to tempt us. God will not test us or tempt us with evil. Satan does. Uh, here, Abraham uh, was told to take his only son up to Mount Moriah. Uh, Mount Moriah was the district around Jerusalem where later on the uh, temple would be built by Solomon. Uh, right now, it's a city of Jebus. Uh, at this point in time, the Jebusites we see in the, in the Old Testament scriptures, the book of Joshua, other places, uh, was where Jerusalem would be. Uh, this mountain range is also where uh, we have uh, Calvary, Calvary at, uh, that where Jesus died for us. Uh, so, very important place historically. Abraham, the great thing about this test here is that Abraham believed God. He believed what God told him. He believed that God was in control of the situation, uh, even though it was utterly impossible for Abraham to figure it out on his own. He tried it before. Uh, that he, When God told him he would have a son, he thought, well, maybe Eliezer, my chief servant, uh, would be the heir. That was common in those days. And so Abraham thought, well, I've got this figured out, Lord. You tell me the promise. Here's how you can work it out. And, of course, God doesn't choose to go with our plans on that. Uh, later on, since Eliezer would not be the, the promise, then Sarah decided, well, maybe a child would, of Abraham's would come through someone else, through Hagar. We know the story of what happened there. We know that uh, as soon as this uh, Hagar uh, conceived and bore a child, it already started problems. Sarah getting jealous. Uh, Sarah uh, forcing her away. Uh, God sending Hagar back. Uh, I mean, just one mess after the other. Why? Because Sarah and Abraham decided that they would answer God's command on their own terms. That's not the way it works. Now we have Abraham, he gets it, finally gets it. Very important passage. One of the great passages of this is the great story here of, of faith. You know, faith, my definition of faith is believing God based upon his word and Acting upon it. If we don't act upon the Word of God, then it's of no use to us. I mean, if you uh, uh, needed uh, a cure from cancer and you refuse to take the cure, you'll die. Well, God here tells us 
this is my word, you keep my word, and when you do that, that's believing God based on what He said, not based on what you think or feel or want or desire, not based on some other book out there, but based upon the word of God. We take God at His word. Abraham took God at His word, and then he, the Bible says that he rose up early in the morning, and he took his two servants with him to Mount Moriah, and told his servants to remain at the base of the mountain. I love this passage in verse 3. The, the phrase says, it grows up early in the morning. No delay, no hesitation. He didn't wait and think, okay, I, I don't know, I, I'm afraid. Yet he knew exactly that God was in control. And so he starts off on what would end up being about a four-day journey of the, going up the mountain and back down the mountain. When they got to the bottom of the mountain, he said to his young men, abide you here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. So here we look, look at the faith here of Abraham. God said through Isaac would come a nation. Abraham knew the only way that Isaac could, could bear a nation was he's got to be alive at that point. And so he tells the young men, we're going up and we are coming back together. Uh, Abraham believed Isaac would return. It says in Hebrews, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. Did he offer him up? Yes. Absolutely he offered him up. Whether he took his life or didn't take his life wasn't the point in his heart. He knew exactly what he was supposed to do. He was more than ready to do that. And God did stop him from, from uh, uh, slaying his son. But in his mind, in his heart, Abraham did exactly all that God required of him. And he says he received the promise of, offered up of his only begotten son. And then verse 19 says, accounting or believing that God was able to raise him up from the dead, from whence also who received him in a figure. So Abraham fully trusted God. And what a great, great passage this is here. Well, we also see not only the faith of Abraham, but we see the submission of his son Isaac. Uh, Isaac has a question as he goes up the mountain to his dad. He says, you know, his dad's over 100 years old, 100 years older than, than Isaac himself. And so they get up there and said, behold, the fire and the wood. Where's the lamb? Where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And the response of Abraham is classic. It is such a great response uh, because this response can be taken in two different ways and yet not contradictory, but two different ways and they both were, is a correct understanding of it. He said, my son, God provide himself a lamb. It can be taken two different ways. It could be taken that God will provide for himself a lamb, and we know the ram is caught in the thicket. Or it can mean, and did mean, and does mean, God will provide himself for a lamb. That he'll provide himself as a sacrifice. Not just prepare a sacrifice, but himself as a sacrifice. And of course we know that's exactly what happened uh, over 2,000 years ago, uh, nearly 2,000 years ago, I guess, uh, when Jesus died on the cross for us. He was and is the only sacrifice that truly took away sin. The Bible tells the Old Testament sacrifices never remove sin. In no way could they remove sin. Uh, it, it was important that they offered up the sacrifice, but not in order for, to gain forgiveness, to gain atonement. They did it out of obedience. If you remember David, Psalm 51, what's he said? He said, offering a sacrifice thou desirest not. Now we know God did not require a sacrifice. David is not telling a lie here, and he's not trying to twist the truth. What he's saying is, the next part is, but a contrite heart and contrite and broken spirit, O God, that I will not despise. David knew that deep down he's got to repent. And if he did that, later on, a couple verses later, he says, then will I offer up the burnt offering. So Abraham, or, uh, David knew that it wasn't in the sacrifice. Abraham would know that it's not in the sacrifice that he was going to make that day. But he was, and we know they were promised the Messiah in the Old Testament, the only one that could take away sin. Isaac here allowed himself to be bound. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what all took place at this point, uh, but he was willingly submissive to his father. And boy, isn't that an important lesson today that we really need of it? Being submissive to authority, being submissive to children, being submissive to parents, uh, parents, and all of us being submissive to even government. Uh, not contrary to the Word of God, but in step with the Word of God.
Bible tells us to honor the king, honor those in authority, pray for those in authority. Uh, that matter, you know, if, if a child doesn't obey a parent, then the child's not going to obey, uh, obey authority of any type. If he doesn't obey authority of any type, then he's not going to obey God. And how important it is we learn the lesson of obeying authority early on. Here, Isaac did that. Abraham stretched forth his hand, and God uh, took, he took the knife, ready to slay his son, and the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, perfect response of Abraham. When God calls, the response is, here am I. You can actually do good study in the Bible. Go through the, find that phrase in the Bible, here am I, or here I am, in response to God, and how important that that is. You know, remember Samuel. God called him at night, and Samuel was ready. Uh, we need to be ready at any point. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the child lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son from him. God knew Abraham's heart. God knows our heart. He knows what, uh, if we're willing to follow him or not follow him. Abraham has a brother named Nahor who lives in Haran. Uh, this next part of the story here, we're switching here from uh, Mount Moriah here. But Abraham knew the importance of Isaac, you know, what his relationship would be with his not found yet wife. And how important it is for believers to be with the believers. Uh, the Bible tells us, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Uh, Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God and daughters of men, is a story of believers and non-believers. We're, we're intermarrying so much that the, the belief system was all watered down. People had strayed so far away from God that God sent the flood because of that unequally yoked together. So Abraham understood the importance of that. And he knew that his brother, he knew his family, he knew they had the same belief system that he had, and so he, he needs to get a, a bride for his uh, son. And Abraham returned unto his young men. They rose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. It came to pass after these things, and it was told to Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah, she has also born children unto thy brother Nahor. Huz is firstborn, Buzz his brother, Huz and Buzz, I don't know if they are twins or not, but uh, there's some names you can uh, tell your children to name their, their children. Uh, Huz is firstborn, Buzz his brother, and Kimuel the father of Aram, and Kezed, and Hazu, and Pildash, and Jidlop, and Bethuel. And Bethuel begat Rebekah. These eight Milcah did bear to Nahor, Abraham's brother, his concubine, whose name was Ruma, she bare also Kiva, Gahim, Thaesh, and Maekai. Now, uh, this is foreign to us as far as the relationships here, of the intermarrying within the family. This is not what God would have us to do today. In fact, we know there are repercussions for that uh, if you marry within the family. But back in these days, there was not as many people on the earth, and God had made provision for that through the allowance at that point. Later on, it would be completely restricted here, uh, not allowed to do that anyway whatsoever. But Nahor and Milcah had eight sons. Uh, the fifth son was Bethuel, who later would have a daughter, Rebekah, and a son, Laban. Well, Rebekah was the one who would end up marrying Isaac. Uh, Laban's daughters uh, were Rachel, Leah, uh, and Leah, both who, who had married, would marry Jacob later on here. Uh, then the, the sad case for Abraham here in Genesis chapter 23. Uh, Abraham's broken heart. Uh, Abraham did love Sarah. Uh, remember he loved her so much that he lied uh, when he went to Pharaoh. Lied later on when he met another king, uh, I think it was Bimelech, uh, that uh, he wanted to protect Sarah and was afraid somebody would take her from him. Uh, it shouldn't have, should not have lied, but nevertheless we, we see the, the rationale that Abraham had. But it says that Sarah now was 127 years old. Uh, these were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kirjath Arba, uh, same as Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Uh, so the sad here loss of his wife. Well, uh, Abraham decided uh, for, for a burial place for her. And so he gives 400 shekels of silver uh, for Machpelah uh, from Ephron, the Hittite. Uh, the, the cave there that he would buy so that he could bury Sarah in uh, 127 years old at, at this time. Abraham and Laban lived 
uh, several years after that, lives to be 175, if you remember. Uh, he left uh, Ur of the Chaldees. Uh, when God called him out of Ur of the Chaldees at the age of 75, and so it means he spent 100 years after his calling to uh, go out to the land of Canaan, uh, all the way up to Syria of the north, down to Egypt, uh, back across again uh, to, to what today is the Persian Gulf area, uh, Tigris, Euphrates River, where Iran, uh, Iraq is, uh, well, one day belonged to Israel, uh, all the way up to the Fertile Crescent, the northern part, uh, where, uh, except through Syria, near Turkey, uh, up along that area uh, that God has promised to Israel. Uh, they've never received it as yet, but I know that they will because God promised that. And then God commands Abraham here. And Abraham said to his eldest servant uh, uh, that ruled, uh, again, uh, Abraham here. Now, let me skip through this again. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of ahead of myself here. Uh, but this is just a story here of what Abraham tried on his own. Uh, did not want Isaac to marry a Canaanite. Uh, and he sends out his son. Well, let me go back to the passage here. Uh, Eliezer here, this is the one that Abraham thought would be the heir. Uh, but God said no. But he's still Abraham's chief servant. And so Abraham develops a plan. Now, a lot of people will put this story here and think that this story is a, uh, a picture or a, a description of Jesus and the church. And it's not. Right? Uh, the Old Testament does not, uh, or the New Testament does not define the Old Testament. The Old Testament defines the New Testament. In order to understand the relationship of Jesus with us, it, that is based upon a Jewish marriage. This is based upon a Jewish marriage. So, Jesus and the church is not a picture of Abraham and Isaac, or excuse me, uh, Abraham and Isaac and Rebecca here is not a picture of the church. It's just a, a normal way that a Jewish wedding worked back in those days. And our relationship with Jesus is the same way that a Jewish marriage. So Jesus' relationship with us is based on a Jewish marriage. This is based on a Jewish marriage. So that's the common denominator is a Jewish marriage. Uh, I, I get how people want to illustrate this with the church. I mean, here we have Abraham calling for his servant, Eliezer, uh, makes him promises, I pray to uh, put thy hand under my thigh, a normal way of, uh, of promising someone at that time. Again, very foreign to us, but normal in those days. Uh, and he said, I swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. He didn't want to marry within the Canaanites. Canaanites were very, very wicked people. Uh, they, uh, uh, pedophilia was very prominent in their way of worship, in their way of life. So, very, very wicked people. And Abraham understood that. He didn't want his family to be a part of that. He wanted a, a wife for his son from someone with the same beliefs. So he sends him a uh, servant, and excuse me here, he sends a servant and says, ah, sorry about this people, I'm learning. Now I shall go into my country, unto my kindred, take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said to him, Peradventure, what, what happens if the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land? Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? And Abraham said to him, Beware that thou bring not thy son thither again. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. And if woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this mine oath. Only bring not my son thither again. And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master, and swear to him concerning the matter. Well, again, Abraham didn't want Isaac to marry a Canaanite. He called for his tr trusted son. What a lot of people do is look at this this. Uh, relationship here, this story, and try to, you know, put it with the church. Why? Well, they say Abraham is a picture of God the Father, and that Eliezer is a picture of the Holy Spirit, and that Isaac is a picture of Jesus, and that Rebecca is a picture of the church. And so saying that Abraham, or God, sent out his servant, Eliezer, or 
the Holy Spirit for the bride of Isaac or the church, and that uh, uh, the Holy Spirit goes, gets the church, and brings it to the Son, uh, Isaac, the picture of Christ, and that uh, is our relationship with God today. I don't put the people in that story. I don't think they belong in that story. It's just the description of a wedding that belongs in that story. In a typical wedding, the father would send, uh, arrange a marriage for the son, and later send for the bride after the son built a house. And of course, that is our relationship with Jesus Christ. He said, in John, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And of course, we know that's what's going on today. There, God has prepared a place for us. And that one day, I believe very soon, that Jesus is going to return for us, rapture us out, and we will be with the Lord there in heaven. Uh, then the tribulation period begins here on this earth, seven-year tribulation period. Uh, a lot of hard times during that time. And, but we will be with the Lord, uh, be enjoying heaven with our Savior at that point. Well, Eliezer went to Nahor in Haran, sometimes called Haran, H-A-R-A-N, or Padan Haran, to gain a bride for Isaac. And no, under no circumstances, God, uh, Abraham told him, was Eliezer to take Isaac out of the land of Canaan. So, no, he's got, to, he's got to get him a wife. The promise involved, Abraham said to his eldest servant in his house, that ruled over all that he had. Uh, again, the eldest servant, we believe is Eliezer here. Makes sense that it would be. Uh, the prayer involved, uh, he took ten camels to the city of Nahor, uh, prayer asking God for a sign that he might recognize uh, Isaac's future wife, that Eliezer would know who, who that it was at this point. Well, they get there to the well. Uh, a request was made, the sign was twofold. Uh, Eliezer wanted to make sure that this was the woman that God intended, or Abraham, uh, well, God had intended for, for Isaac. Uh, and so he prayed, and in the prayer it would be she would offer him water, and that she would offer water to the camels. Well, uh, the servant gets there and says, Let it come to pass, as a damsel to whom I shall say, Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee that I may drink. And she shall say, Drink, and I'll give thy camels drink also. And let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac, and thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness to my master. Now, this is the Old Testament way of doing things. This is not the New Testament way of doing things. This is not for us today to do. Why? Well, in the Old Testament, the Bible has a ministry of the Holy Spirit different from the ministry that he has today. In the Old Testament, the ministry of the Holy Spirit was that he came upon people and to empower them for whatever reason, to empower them to be king, came upon Saul, uh, came upon David, he departed from Saul. Meaning what? That Saul was no longer under the hand of God reigning as king. Remember Samson. Uh, one of the sad verses in uh, uh, Judges chapter 16, verse 20. Uh, after Samson's hair was cut, he goes up early the next morning and says he shook himself like he had before. He shook the, the, the uh, 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 binds loose. And then it says, and he wist not that the Lord had departed from him. Uh, he didn't realize that at that point that God's hand was not on his life. And that's a sad comment about Samson, but the problem with that is today we have a lot of people doing the same thing. Not knowing, not realizing that God's hand is not upon them in order to perform the task that God's called them to. That's why it's so important that we pray all the time. We pray, we ask God for forgiveness all the time to make sure that our heart's where it ought to be so that God's hand is on us. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. God's hands have won us. He'll lead us in the direction that we need to go. Well, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit just came upon to empower. Today, we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. And so, we don't need to go to outside sources. We don't need to look for these outside signs. Why? Because we have the inner dwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. One of the great ministries is to guide us. And that means we should pray about anything and everything that comes to our life. Decisions that we make, we should pray about and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us in, in whatever way. And there are times, I, mean, uh, I, I don't believe that God speaks audibly. I, I don't believe that at all today. Uh, I, I'm not trying to limit God, but I just, there's been no 
proven cases of that today. But I do believe God speaks to us. And I believe He speaks to us in such clear ways it's better than hearing the voice. There are times when God, uh, I knew there's things that God wanted me to do without a doubt. There's no doubt in my mind. This is exactly what God's called me to do at that point. Uh, a couple of instances where God's allowed me to lead people to Him. Where I just knew that this was the moment in time. This was the moment that uh, I needed to go back and, and ask for that commitment about the relationship with Jesus Christ. Why? Because if we're where God wants us to be, it's not because of who I am. But if we're just where God wants to be, if we're available, then God will use us here. So today we just pray. Old Testament, they would ask for signs. That was okay back then. Uh, like I said, we, we've got, we're better. We, we've got the Holy Spirit indwelling us. Well, as the servant was praying, Rebecca shows up uh, at the well with the jar on her shoulder, and she fulfills both of the signs that Eliezer had asked for. Uh, she, Eliezer knew at this point this is exactly who God would have. And it came to pass, before he had done speaking, that, behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother. So it's the right family here. Uh, same belief system. And the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin, neither had known any man, had any man known her. And she went down to the well, filled her pitcher, and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, Drink, my lord. And she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him a drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. And she hasted, emptied her pitcher into the trowel, and ran again to the well to draw water and drew from her all his camels. And the man, wondering at her, held his peace to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. So Eliezer gets the message here. Uh, gives her jewelry uh, as, as a token of the, the, the covenant that would be made here between her and Isaac here. Explain the mission, exactly what God would have him to do here. He says, as the camels were drinking, that he took a, a gold earring of half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hand of ten shekels weight of gold. And inquires as to who she is, his right family. Uh, she agrees that we have uh, prov uh, provisions for you if you want them. And the man bowed down his head and worshipped the Lord and said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who has not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. And Eliezer gets it. Uh, after considering Eliezer's offer for a day and a night, Rebecca decides to go with him and become Isaac's wife. They left to meet him. Upon arrival in Canaan, Isaac and Rebecca did end up marrying here. Um, so here's a passage, Genesis 24, 57 through 66. Uh, I'm not going to read all of this, but a uh, very important passage here. Uh, this verse here doesn't prove, all right, you know, not my jokes, but this is one of them. Uh, not going to escape them here just because it's on video. Uh, but this doesn't mean that Sarah, or that Rebecca here, smoked cigarettes. Uh, sounds like it. Uh, why does that say? Well, it says, Rebecca lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. Uh, I can hear the groans through the video already. No, uh, obviously she lit. Uh, she got off of her camel. Didn't light up a camel. Okay, that's, that's not what it's saying. Uh, what man is this walking the building to meet us? So here's the promise. Uh, then Ketorah. Uh, next week we'll look at Ketorah. Begin here with Ketorah, uh, Abraham's next wife. Uh, in a sense, this will be his third wife that we know of. And Sarah, Hagar, the concubine, saying, uh, situation as the wife, and now Keturah, who would bear uh, children to him. I uh, hope this video works for you. I hope it uh, only improves. I know I made a lot of mistakes here. Uh, I'm working several hours trying to get this, and uh, I don't have the video editing programs that I need. Uh, that would probably help. Uh, definitely would help some because I have to start completely over each time. Nevertheless, thank you for joining us.